share the wealth. Money is like manure. If you spread it around, it does a lot of good. But if you pile it up in one place, it stinks like hell. Junior Murchison, founder of the Dallas Cowboys football team. When you engage others in your success, when you share the wealth with them, more work gets done, greater success is achieved, and ultimately everyone benefits more. The key to the success of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series was our decision to involve more co-authors in the process. Though Mark and I each received smaller royalties, 30 or 40 cents a book, instead of 60 cents, it allowed us to complete more titles, get more media coverage, and sell more books. There is no way the two of us could have compiled, edited, written, and promoted more than 200 books by ourselves. What started out as the collaboration of two authors and two assistants grew to a staff of 12 people with two editors, several consulting editors, two editorial assistants, a permissions specialist, a marketing director, a licensing director, a new projects director, several assistants, and a group of 100 co-authors and almost 10,000 contributors, including over 100 cartoonists. We always did our best to fairly compensate everybody involved. Our staff salaries have been higher than normal for the publishing industry, and we have a generous pension plan and an equally generous bonus plan for our employees. All of our staff members get six weeks of vacation time every year. We have paid out over $4 million in permission fees to contributors and donated millions of dollars to charity. It is our firm belief that this willingness to share the wealth has produced more financial abundance than we could have ever produced on our own. Trying to hang on to it all would have just constricted the flow of money. Principle 62. Find a way to serve. It is one of the beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. Ralph Waldo Emerson, American Essayist and Poet The greatest levels of contentment and self-satisfaction are experienced by those who have found a way to serve others. In addition to the true inner joy that is created by serving others, it is a universal principle that you cannot serve others without it coming back multiplied to yourself. Decide what is important to you. Take some time to determine what causes and groups of people are important to you, what issues call out to you, what organizations make your heart sing. Do you care about housing the homeless, promoting the arts, protecting the abused, healing the addicted, providing education, feeding the hungry, or supporting our veterans? If you love art and think that the schools are woefully lacking in art education, you might decide to volunteer to raise funds for art supplies, volunteer to teach an art class, or become a docent at your local art museum. If you were an only child or really missed having your father or mother around, you might want to volunteer for big brothers or big sisters. Perhaps you love animals and would rather help find homes for abandoned pets. If you love books, you could volunteer to read a book for the Recording for the Blind and Dyslexic. Volunteer Your Skills There are many non-profit organizations that could use your business skills, management, accounting, marketing, volunteer recruitment, fundraising, and so on. If you have organizational talent, consider working on charitable events. If you can easily convince others of the value of your cause, consider becoming a fundraiser for local charities who need your help. If you are a skilled executive, consider serving on the board of a non-profit organization. You'll get more than you give. When you volunteer, you will get back a whole lot more than you give. Research on volunteerism shows that people who volunteer live longer, have stronger immune systems, have fewer heart attacks, recover from heart attacks faster, have higher self-esteem, and have a deeper sense of meaning and purpose than those who don't volunteer. The research also shows that people who volunteer in their younger years are more likely to end up in more prestigious and higher-paying jobs than their non-volunteering counterparts. Volunteering is a powerful way of networking and often leads to business and career opportunities, not to mention more friendships. 
Volunteering is also a way to develop important success skills. Many large corporations have come to realize this and actually encourage their employees to volunteer. Many companies, such as Safeco and the Pillsbury Company, actually build volunteerism into their employee development programs and make it part of their annual review process. Safeco's Building Skills Through Volunteerism program helps employees identify skills they would like to work on. Employees can go to the Volunteer at Safeco intranet, where they will find a guide to the types of volunteer activities that help build competency in the areas the employee chooses. They then have a discussion with their supervisor about adding the volunteer opportunity to their personal development plan. Many prospective employers also report that when they are interviewing candidates for hire, they now look to see if the candidates have engaged in volunteer work. So volunteering your time could well have a positive payoff by helping you land a future job. Additionally, one of the keys to success is building a huge network of relationships, and volunteering lets you meet all kinds of people you would never meet otherwise. Better yet, they're often the people, or the spouses of the people, who make things happen in your profession and in your community. Unexpected Career and Business Rewards Delano's Coffee Roasters has a policy of sponsoring a child fund international child for every employee in the company. As a way to give back to the countries that make their business possible, they sponsor children only in coffee-growing countries from which they buy beans, such as Guatemala, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Delano's pays the $35 monthly sponsorship fee, and the individual employees correspond with their child, send birthday and Christmas gifts, and maintain a relationship with the child. In addition to making a difference in the world, the sponsorship program has proven to be a great boost for employee morale. And while the motivation to sponsor these children was purely philanthropic, it has also been a positive impact on the company's bottom line. All the pictures of the children they sponsor are posted along the wall of one of the hallways in the company. A prospective client was being given a tour of the company and asked about the origin of the pictures. When it was explained that the pictures were of children being supported by the company through Child Fund International, the woman was so touched that before she even tasted Delano's coffee, she decided that she wanted to do business with a company that cared so much for children and for their employees. Service always comes back multiplied. Serving others can also consist of focusing your company's mission on producing products and services that are beneficial to mankind. Sir John Marks Templeton studied more than 10,000 companies over a 50-year period and discovered that the best long-term results flowed to those who focused on providing increasingly beneficial products and services. Whatever one does, Templeton said, he first should ask, in the long run, is this really useful to the public? If so, he is serving as a minister. I think those in business can assure each other that if one tries to give his best when serving the community, his business will not languish, but prosper. Think about the possibility that when you choose to do work that uplifts and serves, that brings people increasingly beneficial products and services, when your efforts are focused on giving rather than getting, then you are going to eventually receive back more than you have given. As Zig Ziglar, one of America's greatest teachers of success principles, was fond of saying, You can get anything in life you want, if you will just help other people get what they want. The world responds to givers more positively than to takers. We naturally want to support the givers. Simply stated, givers get. The Road to Fulfillment Kenneth Baring is a very wealthy man who has appeared numerous times on the annual Fortune 500 and Forbes 400 lists of the wealthiest people in America, with an estimated net worth of $495 million. Growing up poor in Wisconsin, he earned his first money delivering newspapers, cutting lawns, caddying, and as a teenager, working in a lumberyard and in a retail store. After high school, he sold used cars and eventually opened his own new and used car dealerships. By the age of 27, he was a millionaire. 
He then moved to Florida and began a second career as a real estate developer. He founded and built Terramac Florida, and later moved to California, where he developed Blackhawk, one of the most exclusive residential communities in the United States. When I met him and heard him speak at the International Achievement Summit in Chicago, Illinois, he talked about how his quest for a happy life had gone through four stages. He called the first stage More Stuff. In the early days of getting started, he wanted all the basic stuff, a car, a house, a business that was growing and expanding. He thought if he had these things, he would be happy. But he wasn't. He called the second stage of his life Better Stuff. He thought if he had a big mansion, a more expensive car, a private jet, a huge DC-9, a yacht, and exotic vacations, he would be happy. But he wasn't. He called the third stage of his life different stuff. He thought perhaps he had been buying the wrong kind of stuff, so Ken started buying classic cars, expensive ones. He eventually owned over 100 of them, and even opened an automotive museum to display what had become the world's largest classic car collection. Still looking for the thing that would make him happy, he decided to join with his partner Ken Hoffman and buy the NFL's Seattle Seahawks football team. He figured if he owned a professional football team, could sit in the owner's box with his friends, and mingle with the players on the field and in the locker room, this would bring him happiness. But it didn't. The fourth stage of his life began when a friend asked Ken if on his way back from a trip to Africa in his private plane, he wouldn't mind stopping in Romania to deliver six wheelchairs to a hospital there. During that trip, Ken was transformed by the experience of lifting an elderly man who had lost his wife and then suffered a stroke into a wheelchair. The man started to cry, and Ken found himself touched at a deeper level than he had ever been touched before. He felt more gratitude and joy than he had ever experienced before. Inspired by that experience, he came home and founded the Wheelchair Foundation which provides free wheelchairs for people with physical disabilities in developing nations unable to afford one. As of 2014, the Wheelchair Foundation had given away over 940,000 wheelchairs in 152 countries around the globe. In the following year, Ken had the experience of delivering a wheelchair to a frail 11-year-old boy in Mexico City who was disabled and blind. The boy wanted to thank him. So Ken bent down and took his hand so the boy would know where he was. Through tears and an interpreter, the young boy said, I can't see you now, but I will see you in heaven, and I will thank you one more time. Kenneth said he was touched so deeply he was unable to answer him. Then he told us, That was the first time in my life I felt pure joy. Make sure you, too, find a way to serve. For it is in the giving that we receive. St. Francis of Assisi Part 6 Success in the Digital Age What turns me on about the digital age, what excites me personally, is that you have closed the gap between dreaming and doing. You see, it used to be that if you wanted to make a record of a song, you needed a studio and a producer. Now you need a laptop. If you wanted to make a film, you needed a mass of equipment and a Hollywood budget. Now you need a camera that fits in your palm and a couple of bucks for a blank DVD. Imagination has been decoupled from the old constraints. Bono, lead singer of the Irish rock band U2, venture capitalist and philanthropist. Principle 63. Master the technology you need. Technology is supposed to make our lives easier, allowing us to do things more quickly and efficiently, but too often it seems to make things harder, leaving us with 50-button remote controls, digital cameras with hundreds of mysterious features, and cars with dashboard systems worthy of the space shuttle. James Surowiecki, business and finance columnist at New Yorker magazine. Since the first edition of The Success Principles was written, a digital revolution has created a tidal wave of change that has deeply transformed the world we live in. 
the driving force of this revolution over the last 20 years, has been a 98% reduction in the cost of computing and Internet connections, driven by technology upgrades that get more powerful every year. And this trend is expected to accelerate. 20 years from now, computers will be roughly a million times faster, a million times smaller, and a thousand times cheaper than they were when they were first invented. New technologies like 3D printing, robotics, self-driving cars, nanomaterials, and computational biology, all considered exponential technologies that merge the digital world into the physical world, will enable us to enjoy more abundance by generating more breakthroughs in the next two decades than we have experienced over the last 200 years. Thousands of high-flying startups will be launched, creating millions of new high-paying jobs. In fact, it is likely that humanity will eventually develop the ability to meet and exceed the basic needs of every man, woman, and child on the planet. Planetary abundance is within our grasp. When I think about creating abundance, it's not about creating a life of luxury for everybody on this planet. It's about creating a life of possibility. Peter Diamandis, author of Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think, chairman of the X-Prize Foundation and chairman of Singularity University. What's so exciting, but also daunting, is that everyone connected to the Internet has access to more information than ever before in history. But this kind of access has also created a problem. There's so much information that Mitch Caper, the inventor of the Lotus 123 spreadsheet, said, Getting information off the Internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. Because of this acceleration, the rules for success have changed. In the digital age, the knowledge required to become super successful, which used to take years to acquire, is not only within everyone's reach, it's immediate and plentiful. In fact, it's almost overwhelming. There are literally millions of websites, videos, and e-learning resources out there to help you succeed. Because of this overwhelming amount of resources and information, succeeding in the digital age now requires a more diligent approach to time management, information management, and life management. All this new technology is definitely exciting, but if you are not careful, you can drown in it. It's very easy to get lost in hours of mindlessly surfing the web, going from one interesting website, YouTube video, and Facebook post to the next. But if you're not careful, you can end up lost in a rabbit hole of fascinating but irrelevant information. Information is useful, but it is the information you actually act on that makes a difference to your success. The Low Information Diet In his breakthrough book, The 4-Hour Workweek, Tim Ferriss addresses the information overload that now exists and advocates going on a low-information diet. Just as with our food, where most of us eat too many calories and calories of no nutritional value, we are consuming too much information, and usually it's of no real value. Most of the information we are exposed to in newspapers, magazines, books, on television, and the Internet is too time-consuming, usually negative, mostly irrelevant to your goals, and typically outside of your ability to influence or change. Tim recommends that all your reading, except when reading fiction for pleasure, be reading with a purpose. Just as when I am working on this book, even though I am writing mainly from my own experience, when I do need to check out some information from another author's book, I only read the parts that are immediately relevant to what I am writing about. It's easy to get hooked and start reading things just because they are interesting. The same is true for surfing the Internet. When looking for a piece of information on the Huffington Post, it was hard not to open up other articles on three gross things lurking in your ice cubes, four benefits of soaking up some sun, and Wall Street's secret weapon, Congress. These are all interesting and tempting topics, but totally off-purpose for finishing the book. It's so easy to get unconsciously trapped into reading random articles and blogs, with each one leading you to other articles that are equally interesting. You have to exercise discipline. 
Tim goes on to recommend a one-week media fast. No newspapers, magazines, audiobooks, or non-music radio. No news websites. No television at all, except for one hour of pleasure viewing each evening. No reading of books except for one hour of fiction. And no web surfing at the desk unless it is necessary to complete a work task for that day. He recommends that if you need to get your news fix, do it at your lunch break by asking a friend or the waiter. Anything important happening in the world? I couldn't get the paper today. Finally, he recommends developing the habit of asking yourself the question, Will I definitely use this information for something immediate and important? If the answer is no on either count, don't consume it. I recently went on a one-week media fast, and while I was nervous at first without my daily dose of CNN, the Huffington Post, and a slew of magazines I regularly read, Bloomberg Businessweek, Fast Company, Success, Psychology Today, and Science of Mind, I found I had lots more time to work on my highest priority goals, go for walks with my wife, exercise, meditate, and play my guitar. As a result, I canceled a number of other travel, food, and news magazines that were piling up in my office and my home. Steve Pavlina, the author of Personal Development for Smart People, recommends trying on new behaviors for a minimum of 30 days. What if you didn't watch television for a month, or didn't watch the news for a month, or didn't read a newspaper or magazine for a month? Every one of my students who have experimented with this informational detox program has reported amazing breakthroughs in both happiness and productivity. I encourage you to try it. It's a perfect time to thrive. In addition to bringing us knowledge and connections, the digital age has endowed us with a vast array of technological devices and self-improvement tools that help make us smarter, help us never miss an appointment, let us research and work with coaches, find mentors and partners, and learn new skills. There are over a million apps for your smartphone that teach just about anything you want to learn. And there are dozens of apps that help you develop a success mindset. It's an amazing time to be alive and a perfect time to thrive. Technology is no longer something to be feared. It's something powerful we can use to get what we want in life. Unfortunately, many people feel technology is too daunting for them, or that they're too old to understand it, or that it's actually cool to be techno-averse. Just like the early 19th century Luddites, English textile workers who protested against newly developed labor-saving machinery, Many people today have chosen the path of protest over the path of progress. In Principle 31, Embrace Change, I said there are two types of change, cyclical and structural, and that tackling new things can bring you better circumstances, more money, greater free time, and other benefits you didn't originally expect. The digital age isn't just cyclical change that will somehow correct itself. We are living in an age of deep and pervasive structural change, the kind where there is no going back, and the kind of change that can sweep you away if you resist it. Embracing it and leveraging it, on the other hand, can accelerate your success. Of course, the good news is that there's really nothing out there that is over your head. Everything you need to use to create greater success can be learned and mastered. But how do you choose among the vast array of devices, platforms, portals, websites, services, software programs, and other offerings in this magnificent new era? More important, how can we master our use of each tool so that we get all the benefits and none of the overwhelm? It's time to put some policies in place and take control of our technology. Take control of your technology. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten from a digital lifestyle expert is that technology shouldn't drive your success. In other words, your good idea should come first, with technology simply supporting the rollout of your good idea. You don't need to have every device available simply because it's available. What you should be asking is, how can I better manage my email when traveling? Or, 
How can I put my artwork online so that gallery owners can commission showings? Then go finding the technology that supports that good idea. Lucas Jakobiak had the idea to launch his own television show and ended up creating one of the most popular shows in Europe from his 20-square-meter apartment in Warsaw, Poland. He couldn't afford the studio rental and expensive equipment that would be required to produce his own show, let alone negotiate the distribution rights with major television networks as a startup project with no track record. What he did have was a laptop, an internet connection, and a small apartment, one of thousands of capsule apartments built by the Polish government as part of an affordable housing initiative. When Lucas interviewed me as part of a media tour I was doing in Eastern Europe, I was surprised at the quality of the finished show, appropriately named 20M Squared. Yet initially I had my doubts when I arrived for the taping and saw Lucas's living space that contained a bed, a tiny kitchen, lighting equipment, and two iPhones perched on small tripods in front of two kitchen chairs. Today, Lucas edits the show himself on his laptop and broadcasts it on the Internet, which is perfect for the millions of viewers who are watching independently produced TV shows on mobile devices instead of watching big network productions sitting in their living room. Lucas has found a way to use technology to support his good idea. What are some other ways you can take control and use technology to your advantage? Divide your use of technology among different devices. One of the challenges of the technological revolution is that most devices are now designed to do multiple things. We can check our email, send a text, surf the Internet, call people, and take pictures with our smartphones. We can also attend a class, make videos, watch TV, and read e-books with our tablets. Our laptops and desktop computers will do even more. But one thing I've noticed about all this functionality is that because we can perform all sorts of tasks on many different devices, we now tend to multitask randomly on any device within reach, at all times of the day and night, almost without thought to prioritizing what we're doing, versus simply focusing on accomplishing specific tasks that are central to our success. The result is that our technology has started to create chaos in our lives, rather than simply being a tool. The other drawback to all this instant functionality is that it has created the expectation that people will get an instant response from you for all their most pressing issues. I'd like to propose the radical notion instead that you divide your use of technology among your multiple devices and use them for their intended purpose in a deliberate, focused way. When you are working at your job or business, creating documents, producing spreadsheets, writing your blog, doing projects, initiating emails to people. Use your desktop or laptop computer. This heavy lifting of work-related creation is what it was intended for. When you turn off creation and want to consume information, meaning read books, check your social networking sites, surf the Internet, flip through magazines, watch videos, turn on your tablet because consumption is what it was intended for. And smartphones? They're for communicating with people, calling, texting, Snapchatting, Instagramming, and sending impromptu photos. The benefits of this divide-your-use philosophy is not only that it lets you focus on the task at hand, but it also lets you be more present with the people you're interacting with. If you've ever been on the phone with someone while they're Skyping, surfing, and texting, you know how disconnected you feel from them and how disinterested they appear about the matter at hand. If you think you could never give up your mobile devices, even for a few hours while you sit at your desktop computer focusing on your future, considering how much more productive you could truly be without the distractions of multiple devices ringing, chiming, and popping, alerting you to dozens of things that, frankly, can wait until later. Use the Bookmarks Toolbar for your most important websites. Even with predictive browser windows that pop down a list of choices every time you start typing, you would be surprised at the mental minutes you spend every week typing the addresses of your favorite websites. Programming these URLs into your browser's Bookmarks Toolbar 
is a tremendous time saver. For security, use a password manager and always log out. Similarly, spending time searching for passwords or maintaining an up-to-date printed list or trying to remember or create new passwords is one of the most frustrating annoyances of the digital age for most people. And that doesn't begin to approach the time spent finding the login URLs and usernames of accounts you've created all over the Internet. For time saving and security, a password manager will remember your websites, bring up the correct login web page, usually different from the home page, create high security passwords that are strings of letters and numbers a rocket scientist couldn't remember, and automatically fill in your username and passcode every time you need to log in to an online service, membership site, social media page, or other destination. See our webpage, www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources, for a list of recommended password manager applications. Once you're finished at a password-protected website, be sure to prevent identity theft, hacking of your passcodes, and security of your login information by getting in the habit of always logging out. The time required to clean up problems once your private information has been stolen is enormous. And if you were logged in to a site that has your financial details, watch out. Avoid this major headache by always logging out of online services. Just don't close the browser window. Use cloud applications to mirror your devices for safety and ease of reinstatement. While cloud storage, uploading your files to an Internet-based hard drive with companies like Dropbox, Google Drive, and Apple's iCloud, was a major paradigm shift for our time. It has become a major time saver and safety feature for millions of people. Instead of storing your files on a desktop or laptop computer, cloud storage lets you store your documents, photos, movies, apps, and other files via a service that utilizes the entire Internet infrastructure to find space for them. While it started as a way to store memory-intensive files such as music, photos, and movies, it has now become a total storage solution for companies and individuals alike. By uploading your work files to the cloud, you can access them anytime from anywhere, as long as you have an Internet connection. Many people are buying laptops with smaller hard drives and then using the cloud to store the majority of their files. While it does seem scary to put a service provider and potentially unreliable technology in charge of your important data, the cloud has numerous benefits. So long as you develop some rules about what you'll store in the cloud and what, absolutely, must remain private, residing on your own computer at home or the office. You can either store your files in their entirety on the cloud, using Dropbox, for example, as your main hard drive, or you can store files on your own hard drive, but back up to a cloud-based service for peace of mind. While automatic backup software has been around for years, most people either don't program it or they don't connect it to a storage unit. A colleague of mine once had their office broken into and lost every single workshop handout, marketing campaign, product artwork, manuscript draft, and other files when their seven computers were stolen. But because they had backed up all their files into both a physical storage drive and the cloud, they were able to reinstate their business within a day of purchasing new computers. Acknowledge that you have no privacy with digital materials and information. One of the reasons people are squeamish about cloud storage in the beginning is privacy, plain and simple. Are my files hackable? Will the service provider be able to read my financial statements? Can someone else download or divert my files as I'm uploading them? These were all legitimate questions. But while cloud storage is password protected, and has many safety measures in place, be aware that the digital age comes with one major downside. You can have no expectation of 100% privacy on the Internet. As daily news stories tell us, hackers can copy your passcodes from websites where you have created accounts. Emails can be grabbed and read en route. Photos can be lifted from your Facebook page and posted elsewhere in the blink of an eye as can any digital file of any kind. 
My advice is to approach your digital lifestyle with the premise that nothing is private, and become very careful about what you post, upload, email, or say in the online world. Of course, 100% privacy is available to those organizations that require it, but it's currently expensive. Be advised and be careful. One organization I'm proud to be on the board of advisors for is Scruples, a social networking platform like Facebook that has privacy and safety as its underlying premise. Scruples allows you to discreetly share your life, your successes, and even life's challenges amongst just your real-life friends, communities, and loved ones, without unintended public broadcasting, onward sharing with strangers, profiling, or data scraping. Check it out. Contain the sprawl of monthly charges. One final way to take control of technology in your life is to contain the cost of ongoing services you've signed up for. Countless millions of people still pay, via automatic credit card charges, for services long ago forgotten. But a regular review of your credit card statement will give you a list of services you need to cancel or reevaluate especially if newer, less expensive options are now available. This is particularly important if you are a business owner and someone else does your accounting. A friend who owns an advertising agency recently saved nearly $1,500 a month by canceling services the agency had signed up for years ago. That's nearly $18,000 a year, money that surely could be put to better uses. Find people to teach you and learn quickly. No one person can know everything about the digital lifestyle, and training courses and technical support services abound for every activity. So don't be worried that you have to master every activity. Choose those activities you need to use in order to pursue your goals, get someone to help you learn them, then master them quickly, and move on. Do a seven-day technology turnaround. Just as I recommend that you make a list of irritations and annoyances, see Principle 28, Clean Up Your Messes and Your Incompletes, on page 266, you should create a separate list of your technology annoyances. Once you've compiled your list, you can begin to tackle the cleanup process, or hire someone to do it. Completing a technology turnaround could take seven days or less if you focus on the process. We've put a comprehensive checklist of seven days' worth of cleanup activities at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Scroll down to Principle 63 and click on the link. Consider reducing time on your cell phone and your email. Today, a lot of people have taken a drastic approach to regaining control of their life. They've given up their cell phones and their email. The technological revolution was supposed to make our lives easier. But nearly two decades after email became popular and cell phones became affordable for everyone, most of us are inundated with non-essential email, not to mention spam. Many business people I know spend three to four hours a day just answering email. I used to be one of them. Now my assistant opens my email messages and brings me only the important ones, about five per day, to respond to. Some can't even go shopping, out to dinner, or on vacation without their cell phones going off, not once, but several times. This trend is growing worldwide. I still carry a cell phone, but I only turn it on if I am expecting an important call or if I need to make outgoing calls. Because they provide instant communication, cell phones and email also create the expectation of an instant response. People who have your cell phone number know they can instantly reach you for help with their immediate needs. Email messages are delivered within minutes, so people expect you to respond equally fast. When you distribute your cell phone number and email address, you give others implied permission to make these demands upon you. But imagine how much more time and control over your life you would have if you didn't have to react to all of these immediate needs or read dozens of non-essential email messages every day. Recently, I had lunch with four top people in a major publishing firm. They were all complaining about how overwhelmed they were by the amount of email they were getting, as many as 150 messages a day, 
and most of them were being generated right inside the company. When I asked them how much of it was essential to their job, the answer was maybe 10% to 20%. When I asked them why didn't they just tell people to take them off their general distribution list, they said they were afraid of hurting people's feelings. It seemed they would rather suffer than solve the problem. Think about the consequences of not telling the truth and changing things. If they could cut out even half of the unwanted email messages, they would save 90 minutes per workday, freeing up time for more important work and allowing them to go home at a reasonable time. That would add up to 375 hours, or just over nine 40-hour work weeks a year. That's more than two months of valuable time. Isn't that worth a few people being upset for a few days? Principle 64 Brand yourself with an online persona. Personal branding online is not about you. It's about your content. How do you become someone worth talking to, or even better, worth talking about? Matthew Capella, author of Away with the Average, adjunct professor at New York University and founder of SearchDecoder.com. Every day, millions of Internet users go online with little or no thought of the portrait they paint about themselves in the digital world. They make inflammatory comments on controversial blogs. They tweet meaningless messages about their personal life. They post questionable photos on their Facebook page. They upload videos of their hobbies, parties, vacations, and friends alongside professional clips at YouTube, never considering what this haphazard collection of information portrays about them. While much of this content can be removed, much more stays on the Internet as permanent, public content that can be searched instantly by a potential employer, investor, bank loan officer, even a first date. Successful people, on the other hand, carefully manage their online persona. They post only information that will contribute positively to the image they present to the world. Even when they are voicing their opinions and bringing their personality to the Internet, they think about the impact it will have. They have mastered the art of appearing competent, authoritative, respected, someone worth listening to, wherever they are found online. What does your online presence say about you? Just as major consumer brands carefully craft what is said about their products and services, you too can turn yourself into a brand that is carefully developed, managed, and maintained online. Even if your current life project is just to clean up a local park, get a big promotion at work, win the regional track meet, become president of your local garden club, or something else that's not business-related, you can still develop an online presence that inspires others to want to help you, gets people excited about participating in your goals, and advances your cause, whatever it may be. This principle is not just for business people anymore. In fact, with the rise of social media, personal branding as a success tool has grown rapidly and is now within reach for everyone. Personal branding isn't just for celebrities. While many people think that personal branding is just for celebrities, the reality is that Facebook, LinkedIn, Scruples, Pinterest, Google+, Tumblr, Instagram, and YouTube make it possible for each and every one of us to become a brand. And as a brand, we can leverage the same strategies used by these celebrities or corporate brands to appeal to others. We can build brand equity just like them. Of course, once you begin to define your personal brand, you'll see important benefits. For one thing, personal branding requires you to be crystal clear on what you want to achieve and helps you set goals to get there. It helps you create visibility and presence, which attracts people who can help you achieve your goals and achieve them more quickly. But it also empowers you. It puts you in control of the business of you. And having a strong personal brand makes you resilient to what's going on in the world. Strong corporate brands, for example, are successful despite challenges and downturns in the economy because they stand for something unique. The same thing goes for you, if you choose to differentiate yourself with a brand. 
Fortune 500 companies know that over 80% of their market value resides in their intangible assets, including their brand and other intellectual capital. This same statistic holds true for personal branding. Your market value is 80% based on the brilliance of your thoughts and the strength of your personal brand image in the world. As such, wealth can flow from your valuable personal brand. So what are the steps to creating a personal brand online? Step 1. Decide who you want to be. If you're a career professional hoping to move up the ladder or even become a CEO or C-level executive one day, you should know that many of the top candidates you will be competing against are already online with content that depicts them as competent, forward-thinking, and in-demand. In other words, a good investment for some smart company. Many corporate executives are even writing books, joining the speaking circuit, securing media interviews, participating in industry events, even hiring publicists and marketing agencies. They know that, in a competitive hiring situation, the job candidate who has off-the-charts presence in their field will be seen as bringing more to the company once they are hired. If you're a small business owner or consultant, being online with the right message is even more important, since there are dozens, if not hundreds, of other companies your potential customer can spend money with. And these competitors are already online with professional websites, authoritative articles, smart marketing, and social media profiles that tell prospects they're a safe bet to spend money with. Even nonprofits are in competition with other causes for donor dollars, so online branding is important. And if you're an emerging musician, dancer, athlete, or young author, who knows what exciting dimension an online presence could add to your future? To develop an online persona or brand that will advance your career, business, or cause, start distributing content that positions you as someone who can benefit a potential employer, customer, investor, or donor, or inspire a future mentor, coach, or sponsor. Determine the market you want to reach. If you created a network of 100,000 people, all of whom could help your career or connect you with new opportunities, who would you want those 100,000 people to be? Alternatively, what categories of people will benefit the most from your knowledge, expertise, or opinions? Do they work in your industry, have an interest in your field of study, or are they random consumers who have the same hobby, decorating ideas, fashion sense, or entertainment preferences that you do? You don't have to hold a Ph.D. or be a recognized movie star to have a following or build your expert persona online. Even if you're a college student, stay-at-home mom, or corporate employee with big plans for your future, you can still bring useful information and insights to others who find value or enjoyment in following your work. Since you'll eventually be nurturing this following with ongoing advice and updates, be sure you're targeting the market you are the most passionate about and which will provide the greatest benefit for your future. This process of choosing your market is even more critical if you own a business or a consulting practice. As part of the process of determining the market you want to reach, be sure to take a moment and Google yourself. Is this what you want people to see? Next, Google your top competitor by name. What do the search results tell you? Start a blog and build a website. Blogging is probably the best way to hone your brand online. Writing your thoughts, sharing your experiences, and helping people when they bring up a question or comment about a blog post will help you build confidence in your personal brand, but also build awareness of you and your brand on the Internet. For one thing, Google loves blogs, and once you are listed on Google, you will immediately index make appear in its search engine any article you post. This happens within minutes. Not only that, but you can begin to earn credibility and trust among your followers. Starting a blog is so easy that you can get going with just a few clicks. One of the easiest blog platforms to start with is WordPress at www.wordpress.com. You can choose a colorful theme, add an about page for your biography, 
easily upload pictures from royalty-free photography sources around the Internet, and manage blog commenting privileges. WordPress is so easy to use and has developed so many plugins or add-on features that people now use it to build entire websites. While it's not just for blogs anymore, it still remains the easiest blog platform to use. Not only that, it's been around long enough so that there are countless WordPress freelancers who can help you start up. To find one of these, post your blog project on elance.com or, for super low-cost help, try fiverr.com, a website that represents freelancers all over the world who will do small jobs for just $5. As part of the process of setting up your blog, consider creating a buzzword, phrase, or actual trade name that can be tied to your real name. For example, searching the trade name Success Principles will show my name connected to that phrase on thousands of web pages across the Internet. My marketing team, headed by Lisa Williams, has worked very hard to create this outcome over the years. We now effectively own this phrase. Before Success Principles, my buzzword phrase or trade name was Chicken Soup for the Soul. Of course, once you start your blog, it's time to think about how a website might benefit you. A website can feature pages in addition to your blog that describe products or services you have for sale, detail how to hire you for consulting work, provide forms where people can opt in for a free guide, or other samples of your work, so you have their email address for future marketing, and generally represent you to the public as an authority in your field. If you're an artist or photographer, you can feature a gallery of your artwork. If you own a restaurant, you can feature coupons for new customers. If you're a corporate executive, you can feature information on your speaking availability and topics. And if you own a business, your website can generate actual sales for you 24 hours a day, all over the world, if you choose.